So now we have Sean Lo presenting Stumpy, Modern Time Series Analysis with Matrix Profiles. Let's get started. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the conference organizers, as well as the moderators and all the volunteers for having us here. Uh, but just by a quick show of hands, how many people here have worked with time series data before or plan to in some near future? Wonderful. So hopefully this will be a fun talk. Just a little bit about me. I worked for about a decade in uh, academia, uh, analyzing a ton of time series data, but also I've worked in industry and finance for about a, a, a decade now as well. So I work for a US firm called Charles Schwab, uh, where I work on a, a technology and R&D team. And in all of my time series analysis, I wished when I first started that there was this concept that you're gonna learn about today called matrix profiles that existed way back when. And so here's the problem, right? Maybe you have a collaborator, maybe it's your boss, a friend of yours, that's giving you some time series data. And then you look at the data, you visualize it, you don't know if there's any signal, you don't know if this is just random noise, and even, I don't know about you, but when I scan from left to right, I don't even remember what I looked at in the first place on the left-hand side, right? And of course, maybe you have an advanced degree and they say, now perform some magic, Dr. McFancy Pants, right? Apply your favorite methodology there. And for me, when I sort of get this type of pressure, I get this overwhelming sense of dread. And I wish that I could wish it away, right? Or, or cast some sort of magic spell that will say, go away. Or maybe if there were really some magic spell that I can apply to this, that it would at least direct me where to look. Where should I spend my energy on, on this time series? Now, some of the more common magic spells, so to speak, right, are the ones that you see here. Maybe you visualize the data, apply some summary statistics, or maybe you just bypass this altogether, right, and you just apply some random methods that are, that are you know, hot and interesting because somebody else said so, or in the day of larger language models, right, apply some AI there. But the point here isn't to debate which one to use, but instead that there's no silver bullet, there's no free lunch. It's all about compromise. Whatever approach that you choose, right, always comes with, with some gotchas. And hopefully I hear today, uh, I can convince you that this simple concept of matrix profiles should be added to your arsenal. So then, thinking about time series data, what is the goal? And in my opinion, the goal, when you're faced with any new time series data, should be this, to, be, to think about this. If a behavior is conserved in your time series data, there must have been a reason why it was conserved. Right, so that if there's a pattern, right, why did the pattern occur again? And then teasing out these reasons and causes can often be very useful in terms of drawing out insights. So again, when you're faced with a new time series data, you should ask these two fundamental questions. The first question is, do any conserved behaviors exist? Because it's completely possible, it's, again, that it's just random noise. You shouldn't make any assumptions that there is a pattern. And then the second question is, if there are conserved behaviors, what are they, so show them to me, and then also where are they in my time series. So these are very foundational things that you should be doing with your time series analysis, and then not, not all of those magic spells methods will help you with. And so if I think about this as a reformed scientist, what's the most simple and intuitive approach that I could possibly take, right? Sort of Occam's razor, right? Now, whatever that approach is, it needs to be easy to interpret. Well, the thing that I hate the most is that working on some, some technique, Six months later, three years later, I come back, I have to perform mental gymnastics in order to reorient myself right into the right headspace. So whatever the approach is, they should be easy to interpret. It needs to be user and data agnostic, so I can apply it generally into, onto any data, and that any one of my team, team members can use it. It also doesn't require any type of prior knowledge, right, or decades of experience to build a model, or even needing training data in, in order to build a, a, a machine learning model. And then finally, hopefully, whatever um, approach that you're using is parameter-free or has as few parameters as possible. And that if you were forced to choose a parameter, that that parameter is easy to interpret and that you sort of have an intuitive sense of what it means. All right, so what might we do? So let's start with an illustrative example to get, get us oriented. Imagine that this was your time series, very simple one, length 13, so it's just 13 data points. The first thing we can do is we can take our time series and we can plot it, all right? and we can look at it. Does anybody spot any patterns here? I don't really see anything yet. Now, here's our first definition, a subsequence. So given a full time series, a subsequence is simply a part or section of a full time series. So going back to our example, this can be a subsequence, right? It's just a shorter part of the full time series. This is also a subsequence. So everybody, you'll hear me say this word, subsequence. It just means a shorter part or, uh, of the full time series. 
Now then, then the next thing that we do is we might say, well, how might we compare subsequences? So let's say this blue subsequence on the left here, how might we compare that with, let's say, this darker blue one on the right? We can look at them, but the most simple way that I know to compare two subsequences that is intuitive to me is computing the Euclidean distance, which is the straight line distance between two points. So g going back to our example, let's ma maybe take a simpler form of this and, and shorten our subsequences to, to length two. We can plot the light blue one and the dark blue one, and the distance between them is simply just a straight line distance. We don't have to give it a special name or anything. We, let's call it H. And in order to compute H, all we need to do is draw a right angle triangle, label the sides, and we know how to compute the Euclidean distance between them. And of course, everybody here should recognize this as nothing but Pythagorean theorem, right? Any person in high school or maybe even in middle school should recognize this. And if we just plug in our numbers, we'll see that the distance between these two points is square root of two. So we have an intuitive way to compute the distance and to know how they compare. If they're identical, the distance is zero. Anything else would be non-zero. Now we can extend this to longer subsequences, right? So in this case, length four. And what you'll see is that there are these, uh, the third term, right, third element, and that's now we modify Pythagorean theorem by adding a c-squared term. And similarly, if there's the fourth numbers, then we add a d-squared term. So it's, you, as you can imagine, there's very natural ways to extend this Euclidean distance to longer and longer subsequences if you want to compare them. So there's no magic here. And again, we can compute the distance, it's square root of 67. So now that we know how to given two uh, subsequences, we have a very natural way to compare them. Then we can start asking, uh, how do we compare, uh, compute these pairwise Euclidean distances? And what I mean by that is, given this time series, if I want to go back and answer that question of, is this subsequence conserved? Does it repeat itself? What I might then do is repeat my time series and then just compare the light blue with the dark blue. Okay, and I'll add a vector here to just uh, record those distances. So compare the light blue and dark blue use, by computing the Euclidean distance. Because they're the same, right, we'll see that it's zero. We slide it over, we compute the distance again, and we just keep doing this, right, brute force, all the way down, until eventually we run, we run out of subsequences, and what we end up with is something called a distance profile. This distance profile, this vector, just tells you how does this light blue subsequence compare with everything else along your time series. This is brute force, right? But this is not an approximation. This is very accurate. And by, by looking at this, we can then say, do any conserved behaviors exist, right? So we scan along our time series. We say, oh, well, there's something that, that shows a, a distance of zero. But that's pretty obvious, right? Because this is a self-match. It's matching itself. Or it's often called the trivial match. So we often ignore that one. Uh, and then we scan along our time series, and we look for the next smallest number. And the next smallest distance is this, this one right over here, right? 6.9 units away. And that is uh, uh, corresponding to this dark blue subsequence here. So no other subsequence in this time series right, is closer than this dark blue one to this light blue one. Right? This is its one nearest neighbor. Okay? So now we, we don't only compare just this light blue. right? We can repeat this for every other single subsequence. So we move that light blue one along, too. And we calculate all of the pairwise distances. And if we take all these individual distance profiles, stack them on top of each other, remove the unnecessary bits. Most of you should recognize this as being nothing but just what is called a distance matrix, okay? And so if you ask me what's the most simple and intuitive approach, I would say that, I would argue that computing this distance matrix is very simple, very in intuitive and, 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 uh, and uh, um, approachable, but it also checks all of these boxes on the right here, right, in terms of the qualities that we're looking for for an analysis technique to tell us whether or not something is conserved. But obviously, for something so simple, there's got to be a catch, right? And what you should really be asking yourself is, is this simple solution of computing this n by n di squared distance matrix scalable? So let's do a, a very back of the envelope uh, brute force calculation. Imagine you had a thermostat in this room that's measuring the temperature here. And this thermostat was capturing and recording this temperature for five years, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, 60 minutes every hour, and 20 times every minute. That means that every three seconds for five years, it's capturing this, this temperature. After five years, you would accumulate just over 52 million data points. And if you were to compute the squared uh, uh, distance matrix uh, using a uh, very naive approach, it would take you roughly 4.4 years to compute and over 11 petabytes of memory, right? I don't know about you, but as a grad student, I didn't have that much time. So, 
if you ask this again, is the solution, solution scalable? Sadly, it's not, right? And it completely explains why we have these sort of uh, you know, interesting visualizations, statistical methods, right? And approximate methods like, such as building uh, machine learning models, because all of these, you can reasonably do it fast, but you're, you're also throwing away, you're making compromises, right? You're throwing away some of the information. And that also explains why, beyond a toy uh, example, people don't use or don't compute the squared distance uh, matrix. That is until now. So back in December of 2016, a pair of researchers over at the University of California, Riverside, and the University of New Mexico, I'm not affiliated with any of them, had published a series of back-to-back -back papers detailing this concept called matrix profiles. And they've later uh, then went on to publish a, a ton of follow-up papers as well, expanding on this uh, core fundamental concept. And a matrix profile is a vector that stores the distance between each subsequence within a time series and its one nearest neighbor. And believe it or not, you already know what this is. Because if we go back to our uh, dis distance matrix here, what you'll see is that on the left, what you'll see is that where those blue boxes are, those are the, the locations of the one nearest neighbor. And what they're proposing is take out that one nearest neighbor and only record those. Even though we're still capturing and computing all of the pairwise distances, we only want to capture the nearest one. And so then the amount of uh, space that we need is O of n space, but also the amount of uh, uh, time that it takes to compute is only O of n squared. So it's actually quite, quite fast. And they claim that once, you've compute this, uh, once you're able to compute this matrix profile, you can then start answering these two fundamental questions, right? Of uh, do any conserved behaviors exist? And then what are they and where are they? And so going back to our illustrative example here, um, if we magically were able to compute the, the matrix profile for this uh, time series, we have it down here. Notice that it's aligned with our time series. We can also then plot it and visualize it. And the way to interpret this is, again, the, these numbers, right, are the one nearest neighbors. So for instance, this sub blue subsequence over here, its nearest neighbor out of the entire time series is only 6.9 units away. This subsequence is 1.4 units away. This subsequence is over here. Its one nearest neighbor is 6.2 units away. So that's how you interpret this, right? Again, they're vertically aligned here. Then you might ask, well, do any conserved behaviors exist within this time series? And the one thing you can do is you can look at the plot and you can find the global minima over here and over here, which corresponds to uh, this one and this one. And this is looking at uh, this subsequence and this subsequence. These two subsequences are a match for each other. Their distances are 1.4 units from each other, right? So it's not zero, which means that they're not a perfect match. But if you look at them visually, the first two numbers are the same, one and one. Three and two are just off by a little bit. The third numbers are the same, and the last numbers are just off by one, right? So what this tells you is that when we have a matrix profile, you can find near matches as well. And in the matrix profile parlance, this is referred to as a motif or a potential pattern, right? But you can just get this information just by looking at the matrix profile. Now, this is Amon Kyo. He's one of the uh, original authors of the, of the matrix profile. And he said that given a matrix profile, most time series data mining tasks or problems are trivial or easy to solve in just a few lines of code. And then he later went on to say that these are some of the best ideas in time series data mining in the last two decades. And for me, anybody who says that has to be a real gangster, right? Now, of course, extraordinary claims require extraordinary ev evidence. And that was stated by the late, late Carl Sagan. And really, that's how Stumpy was born. We wanted to try to uh, trust, but verify and validate that these claims of performance, right, of being able to compute this uh, matrix profile uh, is actually possible. And so we went on this journey to do this. So Stumpy is a powerful and scalable open source Python library that faithfully reproduces this academic work so that you don't have to. And it efficiently computes the matrix profile using the fastest algorithms that are, that are available to us. Uh, we recently uh, released version 1.13 uh, a couple of days ago, just in time for SciPy. You can condo or pip install it. Uh, it already supports NumPy 2.0 and Python 3.12, if you're already you're on the latest and greatest, but we also support uh, previous versions. We have 100% code coverage, and it was actually released uh, back in April of 2019 in open source, so we published it in JOS. And since then, we've had over 9 million downloads and over 3,000 3, GitHub stars. But the point here is that it's battle-tested, right? You can use it for your, your, your day job. And keeping scientists and developers in mind, 
Stumpy has minimal dependencies. So we only <laughs> rely on or depend on three, three packages. NumPy, SciPy, which probably most of everybody here has, and just Numba. And we lev leverage Numba for our parallel uh, computing within your server, so it leverages all the threads and all the cores on your server. But we also uh, leverage Numba for uh, our GPU capabilities as well. And if you happen to have a distributed cluster, uh, we also support uh, Dask as well. Right? And so we've scaled this to 32 servers, 256 uh, CPUs without any issues. So when you now ask us, is the solution of computing this distance matrix, is it scalable? I would say a resounding yes. And so how do you use Stumpy? So all you got to do is install it, import Stumpy, and maybe you have a time series at 10,000 data points, you specify some window size, and all you got to do is just say stumpy.stump, pass in your time series, the window size, and you'll calculate your matrix, matrix profile instantly. And if you happen to have longer time series, maybe 10 million, 100 million data points, you can leverage uh, other hardware such as uh, GPUs, and the API for this is just four additional letters. Nothing else changes. So you can test on CPUs and then transition over to GPUs very, very easily. And so why should you use Stumpy? So the first thing is that it's user-friendly. It's developed for scientists and data scientists alike, or, or developers alike. Uh, it's interpretable. If you can understand Pythagorean theorem, you've got this. It's also fast and scalable. Again, multi-CPU, multi-GPU, we've done this. And that's very, very reliable. 100% uh, code coverage. We have over 1,500 unit tests that get tested very frequently. And also complementary, right? You can mix and match with any one of your favorite uh, data analysis and modeling tools. But once again, to be clear, Stumpy is not a, a model. It is not a forecast. It is an analytics tool. And I would position this closer to visualization and statistics, right? And if I can convince you anything, it put, add this as part of your exploratory data analysis. Before you can even visualize it, just pop in those three lines of code and then visualize your data. But again, there's no silver bullet. There's no free lunch, right? So the goal here is try things that allow you to move quickly. And Stumpy was one of these tools. And so I'm going to switch over just to quickly for a live demo here. So this, I want to focus everybody's attention onto this time series at the very top. That's that original time series that I showed you at the very beginning. Can anybody spot any patterns? Imagine that this was your time series that landed in your lap. Can anybody spot any, anything interesting, any conserved behaviors? And even if I cheated or gave you a crystal ball and gave you a glimpse into the future and showed you, right, and I showed you the pattern that exists and asked you, where does this pattern exist in this, the rest of this time series? It's very, very hard to spot. Well, Stumpy gives this to you. It turns out that the pattern that matches this is all the way at the other end. And I've zoomed in on it, green and gray, down here. And you can see that they're not a perfect match. There's some differences over here and over here. But for all, all intents and purposes, I'm pretty sure you'd, you'd agree that these are pretty similar. And it's, again, non-zero, right, the distance between them. But what Stumpy also gives you is not only the global best motif match. For every single subsequence along the way, the green subsequence that's, that's moving across, it finds for you the one nearest neighbor. Again, this is not an approximation. This is accurate, right? And notice that the nearest neighbor can exist in the past or in the future. So it's something to keep in mind. Another thing that you can ask from this, right, is what are the potential anomalies? And to do that, you just simply look at your uh, matrix profile, which I've plotted here. Right? And I look for the subsequence that has the largest value, uh, the largest distance to its nearest neighbor, so this peak here. And that's this green subsequence here. This green subsequence has one, the closest nearest neighbor to it is this gray one here. And as you can see, they're not that great of a match. But nothing else is closer. So these are your potential anomalies. Just by computing the matrix profile, you get patterns and potential anomalies for free. Now getting back and just uh, wrapping up here, given the time constraints, we're really able to present, uh, what we're able to present is the tip of the iceberg. But there are other things that you can do once you compute this matrix profile. You can do AB joins. You can ask if I have two time series. Do the subsequences in time series A exist in time series B? All right? You can do approximate matrix profiles if you have really, really large amounts of data. We even support in Stumpy, out of the box, streaming data, where you can update your matrix profile as you see new data. You can do fast pattern matching if, in those rare cases, you already know what you're looking for. But again, very, very rare, right? Because if you know what you're looking for, why would you need these other specialized tools? 
Uh, you can also do clustering with something called a matrix profile distance, and we even support multi-dimensional uh, matrix profiles and more. And for those of you who are uh, already users of Stumpy, here are some of the new features that we've added. So we have top k nearest neighbors. We only talked about the top one, but we now support top five, top 10, top 50, as many as you like. We also have named uh, column attributes uh, for indexing into the matrix profile data structure. We've recently uh, improved the speed of, and performance of, of computing these matrix profiles by about 15 to 20%. And uh, we have good much better uh, uh, time series handling for constant sequences, function ca caching thanks to uh, uh, the work of the number team, uh, multi-dimensional uh, motif uh, handling, and recently we've added uh, race support in, in addition to Dask. So final calls to action. Uh, please contribute. If you're looking for a, a, a safe uh, open source uh, community, uh, please contribute to Stumpy. Also communicate. Tell your friends, tell your colleagues about Matrix Profile and this concept and direct them to, to this package. Also, it would make me really happy if you want to consume and use Stumpy and leverage it for your day-to-day -day work and provide feedback. And so with that, I'd like to finish up. There are a bunch of resources here. Uh, if you have questions, you're too shy to ask. You can ask in the, our GitHub discussions. You can uh, uh, use this uh, QR code. With that, again, I want to thank everybody here. I'll be here uh, after the uh, session. Uh, feel free to come up if you're too shy to ask, but I welcome questions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Yeah, we have a couple of uh, oh, folks are typing, so we'll have a lot more questions. So starting with Sam, this technique seems quite similar in spirit to computing auto correlations. Um, Yes, there, there are certainly overlaps here, right, between autocorrelation. But I think what is fascinating about Stumpy is, again, the interpretability and also how systematic you can be with being able to ident identify that given any subsequence, what is its sort of one nearest neighbor, right, in that pattern. This question may not make sense, but just bear with me. In certain time series, I uh, changed the pattern using logarithmic calculations to narrow the uh, distances between. Does that, w have you done that with Stumpy or is that something you would contemplate? Yeah, great question. So again, uh, uh, the package Stumpy is, is, is something I created, but the fun foundational research was done by other people. But the question was really about different scales, right, of your time series. One thing that uh, the, the astute observer would have noticed was that when I stated matrix profiles, right, that definition, there was an asterisk at the bottom that says Z normalized. So when you perform z-normalization, that means that you take your subsequence, you compute the mean and you subtract it, and then you divide by the standard deviation, right? So you're normalizing that subsequence, and that's by default what happens. So that means that you don't have to do the typical um, uh, 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 differencing, right, or, or um, removing some trend, detrending of your data. Um, but within Stumpy itself, we actually also have um, uh, out of the box. You, you, you can choose not to normalize it as well. So because it's fast, you can try both. Right, instantaneously. In, in the time that we've just spoken, we've already done those calculations, and you can see it. Thank you. Uh, Jack asks, is there a heuristic for selecting the subsequence length hyperparameter? Fantastic uh, question. Is and there support for custom distance functions? So one of the questions that I get uh, asked very frequently is, and, and the researchers get asked very frequently is, how do I figure out what window size to choose, right? That, that, that was the, maybe I misunderstood the first question. Subsequence length yep. hyperparameter? Exactly. So in, in, in this case, right, when I showed you the example, I chose some window size of, of, of length four, right? So this was our original example, and we chose m equals four, and we computed all of these, these, the uh, distances for it. But there's absolutely no reason why we couldn't have chosen m equals one, or m equals 10, or m equals some combination in between. But because it's fast to do this, right, we can actually compute something called a pan matrix profile, right, so giving you a panoramic view. And if we take all of these um, uh, distances here with different subsequence uh, lengths, and we normalize them by, by, by the length of the subsequence, and then we say all values that are less than some threshold will just color them black. And this is the picture that we get. And so wherever you see these peaks of these triangles, actually turns out to be the best uh, subsequence lengths to choose, right? And this is what these researchers uh, uh, actually observed. 
And this is a very natural way, right? So there, there's, uh, even within a time series, you can have longer patterns and also shorter patterns, but you can actually detect them very, very quickly and find the optimal ones. Thanks. Next we have Paul asking Stumpy, Stumpy, was returning one nearest neighbor. Is there a way to say you only care about motifs that have a large that have a larger number of close near neighbors? Yep. So I showed before that to, to use Stumpy, you just say stumpy.stump, pass in your time series, give it your subsequence length, and there is again we have top k nearest neighbors, right? So all you have to do is say give me k equals five and that will return the top uh, five nearest neighbors, and that's it. So that was recently added. Next we have, what advantages does matrix profile provide compared to other change point detection algorithms? So uh, change point detection typically is looking at some sort of uh, changes in, in uh, the statistical distribution. In the case of Stumpy, we're not even dealing with that, right? We're purely brute forcing and asking, for every subsequence, does, its, does it uh, repeat itself? But it doesn't even answer that question first. It just compares everything with everything, right? So you have the certainty of whether or not you've seen that thing before or seen it multiple times. And therefore, can start making the case that if you've seen a, a subsequence three times, five times, a hundred times, you can start arguing that that is now uh, significant or insignificant. And finally, any sprint options? Uh, no sprint options, but happy, again, to, to work with uh, anybody who's interested. Uh, we do have time, so if folks have any questions, you can raise your hand. All right. Thank you. Um, I think I may have lost uh, the train of thought during one of the slides, uh, so if you could re-explain re it, that would be great. But um, you were saying that you take the thermometer you know, if you want to do the matrix profile, you know, it takes a long, long time. Um, but then you then said that later that the Stumpy algorithm is very, very quick. Um, so what is, could you just re-explain the difference from, like what exactly got sped up? Yeah, the, so again, not my invention, right? So there are a couple of things. There's uh, uh, the algorithms, are, are very fast, that were, again, published by the original uh, researchers, but also some very interesting math that isn't shown, right, uh, behind the scenes that have improved um, the computation so that you can reuse some of the computation because of, of, of sliding windows. And then last but not least is hardware, so adding uh, GPU support. Certainly for this uh, 52 million data point uh, uh, example, you can compute it with, um, with a cluster of CPUs, but you can do it with just one or two GPUs nowadays in a very short period of time. So there's some combination that has to happen. So it's not purely uh, CPU based. Thank you. It's, it seems a little reminiscent of like a, a FFT a little bit with the reuse. There's a little bit of FFT behind the scenes, but again, the original researchers, the first paper used FFTs. Their second paper actually reimagined what the algorithm is by um, short circuiting some, some computations. So. Very, 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 very cool. Thank you. Yeah. We have one more from Slack. Are there demos available of the multivariable matrix, matrix profiles? Yes. So if uh, I spend maybe a, a, a strange amount of time developing the tutorials for, for the use of Stumpy. So uh, for those who are looking, if you go to our documentation, we have a multi-dimensional motif discovery example where it runs, runs through not only how to uh, analyze the data, but also how to think about the results and how to interpret these things, because it gets actually quite tricky once you get to multiple dimensions. One dimension is pretty straightforward, but multi-dimensions, it's, uh, it, yeah, you gotta wrap your head around it. Again, I'll be here right after the talk if anybody wants to chat. Uh, my favorite dis distance metric is the angle in between. Could you substitute uh, alternatives there other than distance? Uh, so the, the distance is the, is the straight line Euclidean distance, right, uh, with, with or without z-normalization. Now, two things, right? The first thing is that the academic researchers have shown that other distances for a time series um, aren't as informative, right? Uh, but also the second thing is that because of this sliding window Euclidean distance, that's where the um, uh, interesting bits of re reusing computation is available. Once you switch to a different, um, uh, distance metric, 
then you lose that capability and you end up being slow again in your computation. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much, John. Thank you.